Welcome back to another episode of the Six Figure Creative Podcast. I am your host, Brian Hood, and this podcast, if it's your first time, I'll just go ahead and tell you now, this is a podcast where I try my best to motivate, inspire, educate, do whatever I got to do to twist your little creative arm into being a better business owner. And if this is not your first time, if you've listened to this podcast before, then you already know this stuff, so I don't have to explain this to you. Our goal is to keep you in this business as long as possible, to survive as a freelancer, And our guest today wrote the book on survival skills for freelancers. So I'll get into uh, that conversation here in a minute. But I have a couple fun facts about me to start this day off. I don't ever talk about myself that much in these intros, but uh, I feel like these are worth sharing. I have two interesting streaks that I keep track of right now. The first streak is how long it's been since I last vomited. It has been about 25 years. It's hard to calculate the exact day or year that I last vomited, but I haven't puked in like 25 years. It's probably been closer to 30 years. That streak is being challenged right now because my wife this week has been just throwing up every day with a very bad stomach virus that you got, she got from someone else. And now like, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for the moment that I start to feel it in my stomach. This is going to be a really interesting week to test that streak to see if that ends up ending. The second streak that I'm going to talk about, or the second fun fact is a streak that I've been keeping track of for a while now. And this is a lot less gross and much more worth celebrating. And that is my streak for how long I've been unemployed. (laughs) If you have a day job, that word sounds horrible. Like no one wants to be unemployed because we need money, right? But for me, that's a cause for celebration. As of the day this episode airs, yesterday, I actually celebrated my 5,000th day without a day job. So technically unemployed. I guess it'd be self-employed. I don't know, but it's like, I don't have a day job. So I celebrate that. And I, I want our audience to have that same streak. So if you're in our Facebook community, by going to sixfigurecreative.com slash community, I'd love for you to share what streak you've recently celebrated for how many days it's been since you last had a day job. But I just thought that was worth sharing. I love the little moments of celebration. We actually talk about it in the episode today. And uh, our guest is the author of a book called Survival Skills for Freelancers. She's been a freelance copywriter for like 23 years. So like, if I'm going to learn the survival skills for freelancing from somebody, I want it from somebody who's been doing this since like 1999. I think in 1999, I was in seventh or eighth grade. I was just on the verge of being a teenager. And so I hadn't even thought of freelancing at that point. So she's been in the game for a long time and she knows her stuff. So we talked about everything from getting clients, obviously hard is an important part of surviving as a freelancer, but also turning down work and being willing to turn down work. And this is being an important and crucial survival skill for freelancers longevity, because some jobs just aren't worth taking on no matter what you're getting paid. We talk all about that. And we also talk about a lot about imposter syndrome because most of survival as a freelancer and not just survival, but thriving as a freelancer is getting past our own imposter syndrome. So we talk a lot about that. And I think this is one that many people are going to need a lot of help with this. And we even talk about how to stay motivated and productive when we're all kind of self-directed as people working at home by ourselves without a manager looking over our shoulder. Because like my last day job, I worked at GameStop, which is a video game store here in America. And at that job, I had a manager and the manager told me what to do every day. So I knew when to show up. I knew what I was doing at all hours of the day. I knew when I could leave. I knew which video games I could take home. That was the big reason I worked there. They let us, by the way, I didn't steal them. They let us literally, that was one of the perks of the job is that we could take home whatever game we wanted to play as long as we brought it back before we took the next game. But I had a manager there tell me to do all the things. And one of the things I had to learn when getting out of the day job into self-employment is I had to learn to self-direct. I had to learn to set myself up for success. And we talk a bit about that, especially towards the end of the interview. So I'm going to stop talking about this interview, but I think it's a wonderful one. Uh, So here's my conversation with Sarah Townsend. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me on, Brian. It's great to be here. I think I've had a string of bringing the British on the show uh, lately. I'm not sure why that happens to be, but I just, I love talking to people from across the pond. It's something about your accents. I grew up in Alabama, so talking to somebody with a British accent makes me feel fancy as someone who grew up around (laughs) rednecks. (laughs) So so I think that I just like talking to British people. So again, I I love having you on here. So one of the first things I want to talk to you about is what I think is uh, one of the best ways to survive as a freelancer, again, going back to your book title that I mentioned at the intro of this episode, survival skills for freelancers. There is a skill. I like to think of this as a skill of turning down work that people I think in our industry are really bad at because in some cases we feel like we have to say yes to everything because of the business element. Or in other cases, we feel like if we say no to this, we're going to be missing out on an opportunity. And one of the things I think you talk about a lot is turning down work for just the good of your mental health, for keeping a healthy business. Talk to me about this as being a core survival skill for freelancers. 
Yeah, well, I think certainly having the ability to say no is definitely a core survival skill for freelancers. And I believe that when we start out in the small business world, I think that we feel that we can't do that. We feel that we have to say yes to every piece of work that comes our way. And whether that's just from a fear or a lack of understanding on how to say no and kind of save face or to not offend anybody, I'm not sure. I do talk about a strategy in terms of this comes around to getting to know people within your area of business, other freelancers, building your community and making connections through social media and the like. Because one of the positives of having a really sound basis of other freelancers that you can rely on for support, advice, help, collaboration, for example, is actually having somebody to recommend when you don't want to take the work on. And that's really important. So having a good a community to refer this work off to, I think this is like one of the most polite ways to turn down work because you're not letting someone down. You're just redirecting what could be a potentially nightmare client or just someone who's not a good fit for you. And I have a couple of questions about this. Before I even ask those questions, I want to say that one of the most important parts about turning down work is putting yourself in the position where you can afford to turn down work which comes with a whole other slew of things that we have to get done, like client acquisition, having savings for a rainy day, all these things. We'll get to that in a minute. So for anyone who's like, I can't afford to turn down clients, we'll, we'll take care of you. But for those who are in the position where you are saying yes to work, you should not say yes to. One of the things you're saying, Sarah, is to have a good referral network that you can send this work off to. But what if it's a client that like, you would never want to pawn off onto even your worst enemy. <laughs> like you don't want to refer it out. Mm, yeah, yeah, that is a tricky one. I can't think that that has ever actually happened to me. I mean, I, I guess anybody who approaches me for work wouldn't necessarily know that that is my strategy, that if I don't want to take on the work or I don't have the capacity to take on the work or I'm outside of their budget, which I regularly am, they won't know that Ordinarily, I would refer them out to somebody within my network. So I would just quite confidently just say, this isn't the right fit for me right now. Good luck finding the right person to do the work and do keep my details if I want them to keep my details. If I don't, then I won't mention that. But um, yeah, it's really important to say no to the work that doesn't fulfill you. It doesn't get you closer to where you want to be, perhaps with your business. Certainly say no if they're showing any signs of perhaps not respecting you and valuing you as an individual. Sometimes clients do come to us and they do this thing of sort of belittling what we do. And they may, they may say, oh, oh, it's only half an hour's work or it's only half a day's work. For me, that is a red flag straight away. So I'm the expert. They're coming to me because they trust or they value my opinion in theory. And what tends to happen when you take on work that you have, that initial kind of gut feeling of "Mm, something doesn't feel quite right about this. Maybe it's something about the client's attitude or the type of business that they're in. Maybe it's to do with budget or maybe it's just a gut feeling because it can often be that. The only times in my business that I've not listened to my gut, those have turned out to be the biggest regrets and the clients who are the biggest pain in the butt to work with. And what happens with when you're working with somebody who's difficult, who perhaps wants to micromanage you or they're quibbling over scope creep, you know, oh, can you just do this? Can you just add this on? Well, that's a whole other subject, isn't it, for another time. But like, just make sure that you've got that clearly outlined and that you say, yes, of course I can do that for you. And that's going to cost X amount more. When you have these people coming to you and you just don't listen to your gut, that tends to be when the client takes up more time and more headspace and causes you disproportionately more stress than any other client. And what happens with that is when you finish the job, if they're happy, which let's be honest, quite often they're not because they're a difficult client and they'll quibble and they'll get extra sets of amends out of you or or whatever. If they're delighted with the work you do, what happens is they tend to refer you on to other people within their network. And like attracts like, we all know this. And the chances of the person they refer you on to also being a difficult client are fairly high. And I also believe that when 
you're not satisfied or happy with a particular job or a particular client that you're working with and your heart sinks when you see their name come up on your phone or you see that you've got an email from you. You get that sense of dread in the pit of your stomach. But what happens with that is that you know you're not doing your best work. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're not inspired. You're not motivated. You're not excited about working with this person. And as a result, you won't do your best work. And as a result, they won't be happy. The chances are they wouldn't have been happy anyway. But conversely, if you work with the people who are the right fit for your business and who are fulfilling you and who excite you and you feel like they're like-minded people, that's a big thing for me. I like working with people who I feel they get me and I get them because it just makes life easier all around, doesn't it? And then they're delighted and then they recommend you to their lovely clients and their lovely contacts. And it's it's a, a virtuous circle. You've made a, a lot of wonderful points in that that I want to chat about. One of those that comes to mind is that birds of a feather flock, birds of a feather flock together. I can't even say that straight. But how if when you say yes to that one client who you had, you knew in your gut you shouldn't have said yes to, that turned out to be an absolute nightmare. And then they start referring people to you. Some of those people, you may not know they were referrals because a lot of times people show up in our inbox asking for work that was referred by somebody. You had no idea they were associated with this nightmare client. And now you're saying yes to more nightmare clients who may not be showing the same red flags that this first person shown. So now you are making a very bad pattern in your business. You've got this referral network of potentially bad clients. Whereas if you just said no to that one who in your gut you should have said no to, you would have avoided all that pain. And that's assuming that you even did a good enough job for them to want to refer you, what's going to inevitably happen is they're not going to be happy about anything you do. And man, I've, gosh, I've made this mistake so many times. Anyone listening right now, I cannot tell you how much of a survival skill this is because it's like a skill you have to hone and practice over time saying no to work that you may need right now because as freelancers, we can be feast or famine. It shouldn't be. It doesn't have to be, but we tend to be feast or famine. And when we're in those famine seasons, we are desperately grasping onto the clients that are coming in at that point. And it's, it can be difficult to say no, but what happens inevitably is we start to fulfill on that work and work picks back up again. And now we're dealing with this nightmare client dragging their heels, doing all the scope creep nightmare stuff, not being happy with anything we do. And we're missing out on these wonderful opportunities that are coming up all along the way that if we would have just waited a little bit for the slow season to pass, we would have now seen the light at the end of the tunnel and said yes to all these other clients. So this is definitely a survival skill that we have to have is being able to say no. And I think it's for our mental health because what happens when we get these people and we should probably talk about this is they beat us down and they hurt our self-worth, which hurts all sorts of areas like our pricing. It can give us more imposter syndrome, which I know you talk a lot about, but there's just so much to this one thing. Absolutely. God, there's so much there that I want to unpack from what you said. There's one thing that I kind of want to share that's a tip that you basically said about you may get clients coming to you and you may not realize that they've been referred from that particular nightmare client. It's always good practice to ask anybody who comes to you how they found you. If somebody books a discovery call through my Calendly link, one of my Calendly questions, that's like a, a scheduling link. I don't know if you guys use that over there. We love Calendly on this podcast. I always recommend it. It's a wonderful tool. It's great. So simple to use. But I just have one of my questions just saying, how did you find me? So if somebody recommends me, I want to know, I want to thank them or avoid them as a result. But yes, the thing that is kind of, it's surprising, I think, the way you think about it logically, that turning down work is going to leave a big gap in your schedule. But what it actually does is frees you up time and headspace and the mental ability to attract the right clients and to focus on the work that really will bring you fulfillment. And when you're doing your best work and you know, it boosts your confidence and your self-worth, as you say, yes, working with these people, it can have a seriously negative impact on your self-worth. And what we're looking for is to work with the clients who respect who we are, who were prepared to work with us as an extension of their team. So I always kind of look at it as being on a separate, even level. Whereas the clients who don't respect you, they're kind of, they see themselves up here as they're the client and you're the lowly supplier. And every interaction that you have with them, it just tends to compound that feeling that you're not as good. You're not good enough. And that's a horrible way to feel. Whereas working with the right people, when they treat you on the same level, they 
mutual trust, mutual respect, mutual understanding. You're both working together for the good of their business, which in its own right has an impact on your business, which is super positive. You talked about clients not valuing your time. And I see this all the time in, in my background in music production where the client thinks they know how long it should take to produce a song. And I'm like, well, if it takes that long, then you should do it yourself. Because um, <laughs> they're always under underestimating what it would take. And I'm the professional. I know better. But that's in every industry. And I love what you said about how the client that doesn't respect you, they look down on you. They're up there on their pedestal saying, I'm the client with the money in this project. And you're the lowly freelancer. And you should be so lucky to get this project. They're going to be an absolute pain in the ass. If you ever get that vibe from someone, run the other way as fast as you possibly can. And I was actually talking to a freelancer yesterday morning. And she was in the position where her entire industry is that, where the types of clients she's working with, they tend to look down at her service as a whole. And she's trying to find ways to pivot her entire business so that she's on equal footing, which is where it should be. You should be trusting each other. The client knows their world really well, but you know your little universe very, very well. This moves to something uh, that I think is worth talking about that you are, again, known for is just talking about imposter syndrome. There was research that you that I heard you talking about that 76% of freelancers don't feel talented enough. I know that the client's not valuing us, client's always telling us how things should be done, client's haggling with us because they think it should be this much time or this many hours. That can start to battle away or or wear away at us in our our mental fortitude towards, maybe I don't know this stuff, maybe I'm not good enough, maybe I don't have enough talent to get the clients that, that would respect me. Like, How do we start to deal with that and unpack that as creatives specifically? One thing that I found interesting just to kick this off is to say that I've done a lot of training now of freelancers and and talks about this. And I discovered in my research, well, 86% of UK professionals, 86% even higher than 76% of freelancers have suffered from imposter syndrome, or that's at least have acknowledged or admitted to this survey that they've suffered from it. So it's so much more common than people realise. Even professionals, I've sort of started as a bit of a hobby, kind of collecting quotes from people who you just consider to be legends, Tom Hanks, Serena Williams. I've got a quote from Stephen King, who wrote one of my absolute favourite books, about writing, which is cunningly enough called On Writing. There's a quote in there about how he questioned whether it was worth publishing a little book on writing. Would anybody actually be interested? James Clear, who wrote Atomic Habits. David Attenborough, who was an absolute legend here in the UK, um, naturalist. It's everywhere. So I think one of the things, the ways in which imposter syndrome has power over us is that feeling of, oh my God, I'm the only person who feels like this. I think just that realization that actually everybody from time to time gets these feelings of self-doubt and, you know, I'm going to be found out, like, I don't really know what I'm doing and, and I'm a fraud and all these things. But it really does impact everybody from kind of the intern to the CEO. So certainly in the creative industry, particularly when we're freelance, I think one of the dangers of working for yourself is unless you're working in a, do you call it co-working in the States? Yes, co-working spaces, we work and things like that, yeah. Sure. So unless you're working in a co-working space or you're part of a regular network and you have the opportunity to talk to your peers about these feelings and actually you feel okay with opening up and being vulnerable, and as Brené Brown says, it's a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness, right? Actually feeling that if you're working on your own, you're isolated, you're physically isolated and kind of mentally isolated from other people who are doing the same or a similar job to you, it's very easy to feel that nobody else understands what you're going through. And I actually think that that compounds the strength of the feeling. And we can take away a lot of its power just by talking about it. I don't mean navel gazing and kind of going all like, oh, woe is me, I've got imposter syndrome, but actually just going, oh yeah, God, you know, I'm worried about doing this talk next week. Oh, well, you know, I did one last week and it was fine and you'll be great. You've got this. Just having a few words of encouragement. That's something that we do tend to lack when we work on our own or isolated. So I share six strategies for dealing with imposter syndrome in the book. And they are things like kind of start to gather the evidence of the fact that you do know what you're doing. I keep what I call, and I recommend this often, a folder of photos on my phone that I call a boost bank. And every time I get a testimonial, a recommendation, a great book review, 
a five-star review, somebody raves about what I've done, somebody thanks me, I take a screen grab and I save it to my boost bank. And then if I'm having a day where I just feel as if I'm not making progress, I feel as if I'm failing, I feel down on myself, the negative self-talk kicks in, all of those things, we can all relate to that, can't we? And I'll just take a look in my boost bank or I'll have a look at the kind of evidence that I've collected that I do know what I'm doing. You know, hell, I've been doing this for 23 years as a freelancer and it's a really long time. <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, sometimes it's not all bad, I think is worth mentioning as well, because imposter syndrome can alert us to gaps in our knowledge. And one of the really important things when you're working for yourself is just remembering that you have to learn every day. You're always learning. You cannot ever afford to stagnate. You can't ever afford to sit back and say, do you know what? I've got this. I don't need to try anymore. The moment you do that, you've failed. So we always have to learn. We always have to keep on top of our game. We have to keep up with trends in our industry. We have to keep up with technology and tools. That imposter syndrome feeling, if you kind of think, oh, gosh, I don't really know what I'm doing. Sometimes that's just a trigger that we need to brush up on our skills. And that's a good thing. I also think that it keeps us from becoming arrogant because nobody likes arrogance and kind of cocky behavior like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm the best at what I do. We need self-belief, but we need a beautiful balance between self-belief and arrogance, I think. Yeah, I think our audience, for the most part, our audience as a whole, if you were to, to take our audience and put it into a single individual, that person in no way struggles with being too self-confident <laughs> <laughs> and almost wholly has issues with imposter syndrome. So I want to talk about a couple of things you mentioned there. One is you said always learning, which anyone listening to this podcast, I don't have to expand on that because you're listening to this podcast already. So you're doing something to improve your skills, to get outside input from other people, which is a very important part of being a business owner. We have to improve our skills. And myself, I'm an Enneagram 8, for anyone who knows that. I tend to go to a five in stress, which just means the endless researcher. When I'm stressed out about something, I naturally go towards learning new things, which is actually a pretty interesting way to deal with my imposter syndrome is like, this is my 211th episode of this podcast. I still get imposter syndrome from time to time when interviewing guests, especially ones that have done some major thing that I can't even comprehend doing. Like last week, our guest was James Victoria. He's got art in the Louvre right now, which is like, to me, it just seems like a really cool big thing. He's still battles with imposter syndrome himself because he talked about how he has to have other people handle all the money stuff for him because he doesn't like talking about pricing his work. So it's just one of those things that we all battle it in our own weird ways and finding ways to cope with that. For some people, it is learning more. For some people, it is talking about it, acknowledging it, knowing that 76% of freelancers deal with this. And I guess some of it's probably just if you're not around a circle of people in a community to talk about this stuff, at least this podcast is at least addressing the issue in some way, shape or form. Like this sort of content is helpful to know that you're not alone in this issue. Everyone struggles with it. Probably even Sarah deals with it in some way, shape or form occasionally. I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no, I 100% do. The boost bank also. That was another idea you had that I thought was brilliant. I have something similar. Um, just going back to what you said, where you have a uh, an area where you keep all your testimonials and, and cool things has happened to pull from when you're feeling down, I have, it's a similar thing. I have something I just call my motivation folder in my Dropbox, which is accessible from every device I own. And in that folder is any kind thing someone has ever said to me, whether it is a testimonial, whether it, it is a happy client, whether it is someone sending me like their life story and in an Instagram DM about how this podcast changed life or whatever, like that sort of stuff. You cannot possibly walk away from that feeling down on yourself after reading through those things. And uh, that's a good reminder that it's probably time for me to go back through my stuff in there. I don't revisit it regularly enough. And I think as creatives, at least this is my struggle, is I don't celebrate the wins enough. I've talked about this in the past where I do these things. They're all awesome things. Sometimes, sometimes they don't work out. A lot of times they don't work out, but I'll do these really cool things. And my wife will make this big deal about it because it should be a big deal because I've hit a big milestone or something. Like the day this episode comes out, is actually the day after I celebrated my 5,000th day of unemployment. 
which sounds like a bad thing if you're looking for a job. It's a really good thing if you're creative and you never want to have a job. But that's something that's been in my calendar for the last thousand days or so. I wanted to keep that milestone to try to celebrate it more. So I think celebrating these little wins is just a really good way of, of helping us get past imposter syndrome sometimes to just say like, this is all the stuff I've done. And I need to acknowledge that and celebrate that. It's interesting that you should say that because that's actually one of the six strategies that I share in the book as well. So um, yeah, right with you with that. And I also think that celebrating the wins kind of tallies up with the gathering evidence thing. Just reminding yourself that you do know what you're doing. It might not be qualifications or might not be a piece of paper that says that you can do what you do. In my case, I didn't go to university. I chose not to go to university. I just wanted to go out to work and it's not held me back one bit. I'm running a successful business. I love my job. I get to choose my own hours. I get to have Fridays off, which is rather wonderful. Celebrating your wins is such an important thing. I'm an anagram one. I don't think that's a good thing to be. I'm very, very driven. I'm very direct. I'm very like bound, bound, bound. And that for me means that I finish a project and I'm just like straight on to the next thing. I'm just always, always achieving ticking things off the list. Even for me, I was joking with my partner about this the other day, about the fact that even for me when I'm relaxing, it's like in my head, I'm like, have half an hour of relaxation, have half an hour of sitting and reading. And that's an achievement. Like I, it's like I kind of gamify everything my, in my head. Everything's got to be an achievement. Stopping, pausing, reflecting. They're not things that come naturally to me, but they're really important. And actually looking at how a project went and what would you do better next time? What, how would you like to improve? And what went really well? You mentioned not going to university. I don't think I could have even qualified to go to university when I was uh, out of high school because my GPA was like a 1.9, which is just really bad. If, I don't know how your grading scale works in the UK, but I don't think I could have been accepted at any university. So I weirdly have that as a badge of honor, which is why, probably why I've mentioned this like a million times in this podcast, but it's not an imposter syndrome thing for me, but it does bring up an interesting thing. I, I heard you talking about this on another podcast you were on. Basically, one of the things that leads us to imposter syndrome is comparing our chapter one to someone else's chapter 50. And I think social media is a big part of this where you're, you have this comparison syndrome. Can you talk about that a bit? Because I think this is something our audience as a whole struggles with. Yeah, I call it comparisonitis. And I do honestly think that we were so much better off in that one respect before social media came along because it is so visible. It's always there. I mean, how often do you actually put your phone down? I've got my phone in my hand or in my pocket 99% of the day. And the first thing I do when I pick up my phone is check my social. It's just natural. And we tend to zone into people who are doing what we consider to be the same or a similar job to us and tend to be drawn to the people who are in our mind doing what we do, but better, faster, stronger, <laughs> fitter, and having what we perceive as being more success. And there's an element of wanting to keep it track of what other people are doing because it can inspire us. It can give us ideas that we can not copy, but we can adapt for our own social media presence and kind of transform into being part of our own personal brand, like put our own hallmark on that thing and adapt and use it. But when we start comparing ourselves and our progress and our output to something that someone else is doing, that really in itself has a, a very negative effect on our self-worth. I always say it's better to just stay in your own lane. And the only comparison you really need to do is it's cheesy. Okay, I warn you, but you today with you yesterday, because as long as you're making progress in your own lane, that's really all that matters. Anne Lamott said, don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. And I think that's precisely summed up in social media. What we have to remember is that social is obviously edited highlights. It's only the tiniest, tiniest surface. It's like the frost off the surface of the pint of beer. It's like the best bits, isn't it? So all we're doing is just judging everything, all the messiness, all the reality and the clumsiness of freelance life from our perspective as we're living it. And actually, we're not giving ourselves permission to edit out the bits that we're not seeing from other people. And as you say, the chapter one versus the chapter 50, if when I first started doing video, for example, 
I was going to name drop it, but I won't. It's so bad. I recorded a video and and I scripted it because I thought I can't just talk. I scripted it. And then I had this auto cue type software thing. And I thought this is going to be great. I'm going to come across so professional. And I did. I was professional, but I was wooden as heck. And I look back at it now and it's just, it's mortifying. Whereas now I just talk and I've kind of embraced the fact that when I do webinars and when I speak on stage and when I speak at events, nobody is going to get polished perfection because that is just not me. I tend to go off at tangents. I tend to forget what I was saying. I'm a bit... Oh, oh, you know, I remember doing a podcast interview once and I'm really into birds. So I looked out of my window and usually it's actually not now because I can see the sunshine outside, but usually I have to keep my blind shut and a bird flew by and I went, oh, look, a heron <laughs> in the middle of a podcast interview. So yeah, it's just kind of embracing you do you, you know, embracing who you are and what your own personal strengths are. And don't try to be like anybody else. Take inspiration from other people, sure. Take inspiration from people who are perhaps a couple of steps further forward on the journey. But don't be critical. Give yourself time. Like the first time of everything for everyone is rubbish. We just get better and better and better with practice. Yeah. And I, I bring my wife into this podcast a lot as far as bringing up the things that she's going through in her life. Cause it's probably easier for me to, to think about and relate to than it is my own problems and issues, but she has a TikTok account. Go follow it. If anyone's listening, Meg's tea room, I'm gonna give her a shout out. And she's grown it to, I don't know, 35, 40,000 followers at this point, which is bigger than our TikTok account, which she's doing great. But all along the way, she's just had these little moments of imposter syndrome and where she's doing the comparison thing, someone who has 100,000 or a million followers, how their content looks, how it's performed, how it's done, the, like how all of the elements come together and they're like, you know, their chapter 60 moment. And she's on chapter like 15, you know, she's newer at this. She doesn't have the experience. And I have to ask her sometimes, like, would it make sense given the time, effort, and energy you've put into this, that it would look as good as someone who's three years into their account? The answer to that is no, it's, it doesn't make sense for it to be as good as them. But if you look back at their content at the stage you're at now, you're far above where they ever were at the same point in the journey. And I think that's a, probably a much more fair comparison to make than looking at someone else who's three years into a skill or a social media account or whatever. Speaking of social and curated life and uh, everyone else's highlights real, let's talk about yours for a minute. Um, you're pretty active on social and as freelancers, social media for the most part, shouldn't be something that's completely ignored. I've tend to ignore it my entire life. I'm not certain it's 100% required, but I see the value in it. And I think the way you do it, we were talking beforehand, you do social media in an interesting way where you fit it in between the downtimes in your day, where you seem to be active on there. I went to your socials and you're like pretty active on it, but it doesn't seem to, to rule your day or week or month. It's like, it's just, you fit it in the gaps. Can you talk about how you do socials and the effect it's had on your business? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think for me, the way I do social is probably not the way that the social media managers would advocate doing social. I don't have a content plan. I never have. I don't have a particular time of day scheduled. You asked me earlier if I knew how much time in my week I spent on social, and I would say it fluctuates wildly from week to week, but I don't have a clue how much time I spend on there. As you said, I tend to do it when I'm waiting for something. I tend to do it. If I get a burst of energy and a burst of creativity, I'll just capture it in the moment and I will do a post and I'll save it as a draft and I'll post it later when my audience is active. So I think, first of all, I wrote a blog post and I also talk about this in Survival Skills for Freelancers about how social media can be such an incredible positive impact in our lives as freelancers because it's free advertising. It gives us this enormous, incredible reach. It's always on. It's always a presence. Whether you're there or not, the presence of your business and your personal brand is always there. So fantastic. Great stuff. We can build our following with kind of, in some ways, very little effort, but also it can feel like a full-time job. And unless your full-time job is being a freelance social media manager, it shouldn't be. So it's really important to focus, I would say, on not trying to be everywhere and all at once, but instead to do a little bit of research on where your clients hang out, your target clients, and focus on those two channels, but only if you enjoy those channels. So say for me, if somebody said, oh, all my 
potential clients are on Facebook. I still wouldn't use Facebook. I have a Facebook page. I only keep it up to date just by default because I cross post from Instagram and I only started doing that recently. I hadn't posted on it for absolutely ages. I haven't updated my Facebook profile picture for about five years. It's just not my place. So I use the platforms that inspire me, that energize me, because for me, so much of business is to do with energy. If I'm feeling the positive energy or I'm feeling enlivened about something at any particular moment, that's the thing I want to be doing. That's how I often decide my business priorities. I don't tend to have goals. I always know exactly what I'm working towards. But if I create a goal, then that becomes my obsession. And that's not healthy because addictive personality, obsessive brain, it's not a good combination. But yeah, I would say stick to perhaps two platforms and do them really, really well. Learn how to do them well, but only use them if you feel comfortable with them. I mean, initially, of course, you're not going to feel comfortable if it's new to you because it will take some time to get your bearings and to work out what works well for you and to work out how to best engage your audience. Just make sure that you give something of yourself, like plenty of yourself, I think, really, rather than people saying, and I don't think this is so much of an issue in the freelance sphere, but people saying, oh, I have a business profile and a personal profile. And on my personal profile, I share pictures of my kids. And on my business profile, I share motivational quotes, but never the twain shall meet. So I was mentioning to you earlier, um, Brian, that I have an Instagram account that I've had for donkey years that is all photography. It's all taken on my iPhone. It's all photographs of beautiful Cotswold landscapes because I'm lucky enough to live in the most beautiful part of England. And I have another account which is copywriting. So that is about language. It's about words. It's language memes. It's personal stuff. It's also all the freelance stuff. That's where all the imposter syndrome, the mental health stuff, all the know what to charge, all this kind of stuff shows up. I enjoy it there because I've got a community there. Got close to 10,000 followers now, but there's a bit of a story behind that. Yeah, actually, I want to get to that story in a second, but I, I do want to say, I mentioned a couple of things you said there because it's worth just kind of reiterating and giving my own thoughts on, on your thoughts. You talked about only investing into time, effort, energy into a platform that you resonate with. And I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that's why I've been so like inactive on social media is because I don't utilize it. If I look at my phone screen time app, I average maybe 30 minutes per week on all social media apps total because I just don't like social media. I'm sorry. Like I go on there to participate in our Facebook group that has almost 10,000 people in it and maybe one or two other groups that I participate in because I enjoy the communities, but that's it. And then the rest of it's me just checking messages that I get sent. That's my social media experience. I refuse to let TikTok's algorithm train to my personal preferences. So I never swipe on there. And that helps me, keeps me sane and gives me time back. But the area that I spend a lot of my time is listening to podcasts. And so that platform resonates with me, which is why I love doing podcasts. That's why I'm on a podcast now. That's why that's my content medium of choice. And it's not social media. So with you, you do use social media, but you also use blogging as your content medium of choice because you're a writer. It makes sense. So for anyone who's like, I just can't do blah, whatever this blah is for you. Everyone has the blah thing that they don't want to work on because they hate it. It could be TikTok. It could be Instagram. It could be blogging. It could be podcasting. It could be YouTube. It's whatever these things are. You don't have to do it, but find the thing that works for you. Don't force something. But also whenever you do decide to do something, go all in with it because if you just decide to dabble in 10 different things, half-assing all of them, none of them are going to work. So let's jump into that story you were talking about of part of the story behind your followers on, on Instagram. You dropped a bomb on me right before we started recording. I was like, oh, I got to fit this into the interview. I have no idea what this is, by the way, but you have an Instagram reel with 10.6 million views on it. And I just have to have the story behind this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I did, just to give it some context, before this reel went crazy, the highest number of views I had on any reel, and I use reels a lot. I wouldn't say I'm especially good at them, but sometimes you just strike lucky. Sometimes something resonates. So the highest number that I had before was 5,500. And I share a lot of kind of productivity tips and like life hacky kind of things that are going to make people's lives easier. And for me, anything that is a time saving tip when you're a freelancer is a win. So one day my son came home from work and said, mom, I bought some gluten-free pastry because I'm going to make these pan au chocolats because I know you love pan au chocolats and you've not been able to have one since you had to give up gluten. 
So I was like, oh, okay, this looks great. And he's just like, oh, super simple, super quick thing to do. So I was like, okay, phone at the ready. I'll start a time-lapse video of you making these things. And it is literally like a two-minute, plop the chocolate on, roll it up, put it in the oven, job done. So I did a video of it, a time-lapse video, and I thought, shall I share this as a reel on my Instagram? It's not one of my content pillars. I do actually know what my content pillars are, believe it or not. That's about as planned with my social media as it gets. But then I was sort of arguing in my head that maybe it was because it was still a time-saving thing. It was still something that would kind of make people go, oh, oh, that's a good idea. So I shared it and it plateaued at about 4,000 views. And About three weeks later, I suddenly started getting three likes per minute on this video. And I thought, this is weird. Maybe somebody shared it. Somebody with a load of influencers shared it. Or maybe it's popped up on that Discover page. Anyway, I never found out what the reason was, but it just kept climbing and climbing and climbing. And I got so excited by the time it got to five figures that I actually shared on LinkedIn going, oh. I've got a post going viral that's got 12,000 views <laughs> and I just should have saved it until it really hit momentum. I still get likes on it now and it's about how to make a pan au chocolat and now I have all these excess followers. Can you talk about um, your content pillars for social media? Because this is an area I think you can probably touch on a bit and this is something that I don't think gets brought up much when talking about social media. People always want to know what is what should I post about? And obviously, if you're a copywriter, this might be relevant for you. But if you're not, this may not be relevant. But you have to use this sort of approach to your own own business and your own niche and targeting your own people. But what are your content pillars and how did you come up with those? So I've just had to open my Trello board because I confess, I can't remember what all five of them are unless I'm looking at my Trello board. So I have this really, really organized Trello board that I set up after doing a one-hour workshop that I booked through Instagram with somebody who is in my, what I consider to be my community. And it was something like £40 only. And I thought, well, I don't do any content planning at the moment. I probably could learn a lot from this. And the first part was all about different types of content that you could post and getting better with the actual nuts and bolts and the mechanics of how to use Instagram. But the last 10 minutes, she shared her Trello board for content and I was just blown away. So I just took a screen grab and just copied the way she'd set it out. So it's colorful. It's easy to use. So my content pillars are obviously freelance life, language, which incorporates um, confusables, which is to do with the next book, tips and how-tos which tend to be the time-saving tips and the kind of life hacks and the productivity tips inspiration and lifestyle which is kind of a bit more like particularly I do a lot of reading so I tend to share a lot of book recommendations local recommendations kind of massively into nature so kind of nature and walks and that kind of thing and then how to work with me So those are my five things. And then I have a kind of an inspiration section at the top of each of those boards. And then underneath, I have specific posts. If I get stuck at any point, I can literally just go, okay, just go to the inspiration board and just get something from there. And I haven't got stuck since. I literally have not run out of an idea of what to post since. You use Trello, which I love Trello, by the way. I use ClickUp now, but Trello has been a wonderful companion through the years for me. But you just use Trello to organize any ideas you have for posts in those pillars specifically. Do you actually set aside time to brainstorm these things? Or is this just an area for you to like keep track of ideas? It's the latter. I know a lot of people use a tool, a software tool or an app of some sort to actually schedule their posts and to put their posts together. And I experimented with that, but I just found I got a little bit lost. So I just stick now. I have quite a strong identity, I guess. I wouldn't really call it my brand. It probably is my personal brand in some ways, but I know what my posts look like. So I tend to alternate from a kind of visual textual post and then a photograph and a visual post and a photograph. So if anything, I run out of ideas of what to post for my photographs. I never run out of ideas of kind of my instructive tip posts, advice posts, they're all there. And it it is literally, I just go into the board and I'll think, oh yeah, you know, I meant to um do uh, how-to posts, for example, on saving hashtag groups. Because you know how time-consuming it is to type in hashtags? 
No, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know anything about hashtags. <laughs> <laughs> I said that to the wrong person. But most of us, it's just kind of like, oh, what shall I use for my hashtags? I have and have had for a long time multiple groups of hashtags to mix it up because it's good for the algorithm if you mix them up. So when I come in to put my hashtags, I don't have to type out 30 or however many is the flavor of the month. They're just all there. So I've got book related. I've got language related. I've got Cotswolds related. I've got freelance related, imposter syndrome related, all this kind of thing. So yeah, I have some specific ideas of posts that I haven't yet launched and I'm never going to run out of ideas. I don't sit and brainstorm because I find I don't need to. Usually I'll get It'll be like buses, you know, they say you don't get any ideas for weeks and then three come along at once. And that's very much the same with the way I use Twitter, actually. I have lots of scheduled, automated scheduled posts, which my VA sorted for me. I wrote them and she sorted them and they just go out as and when. So I'm always there. But when I'm actually there and my brain is in Twitter mode, it'll get a lot of tweets in one day and then nothing for a few days. There's a specific pillar you talked about that caught my ear that I think I'd love to, for you to talk about is you said content about what it's like to work with me or how to work with me. Can you talk about that? Because I feel like that's a, an actual thing that many people are missing on their social media strategy, especially if you're a freelancer, is actually having posts that are related back to what it is that you offer as a freelancer in order to get people to work with you. Are these like straight promotional posts? Are these just like giving you an overview of what it looks like to work together, like behind the scenes of you doing work? Like what do these look like and how do you do these? Yeah, this is the weakest of my five content pillars. I'm not the biggest fan of doing straight promotional posts, but I do realize that it's really important. For me, it's more about building up the no like, and trust. So I will do things like the meet the maker kind of hashtag. So meet the freelancer, meet the business owner, whatever, where you kind of just introduce yourself again, rather than just assuming that everybody who follows you knows who you are and what makes you tick and some interesting facts about you. So I find those posts are super popular, just sharing a photo of me doing something that I love doing and kind of seven facts that you didn't know about me. So the kind of quirky things that people wouldn't guess. I don't know if I class that under work with me post. It's probably a bit of a cop out saying that, but the direct post that I do, I do, I'll do a post for the book with just reminding people who it's for, who it's helped, the fact that it's sold in 22 countries, the fact that it's got 350 odd five-star reviews, all the kind of positive stuff, which actually after two years of releasing a book, you kind of feel like, oh, doesn't everybody know that already? I don't want to talk about it. It feels slightly cringeworthy, doesn't it? But a lot of people do it really well. I'm not one of those people. It's something that I'm working on. It's a work in progress. Creatives in general, I think, are, are just bad at I say bad, they struggle with self-promotion and talking about themselves in a sales environment. But it seems particularly like in England, that culture doesn't like that the most. Like you guys are most allergic to pitching yourself to other people. And I think it's interesting, but I guess it, it goes to show that like, you don't have to do what other people tell you to do as a freelancer. You get to pick your own adventure. If you choose not to be that way, you can still make it work. You may have to work harder in some regards if you just can't do a direct call to action towards what they should do if they want to work with you. But at the end of the day, you you get to be the one that picks how things are done. So if you don't like that type of approach, then skip it. Like if you want to be more polite and more friendly and you don't want to, you don't have to be aggressive, by the way, but if you don't want to be the aggressive, like go-getter marketer type, you don't have to be. But that doesn't mean you, you should avoid all social media just because you don't like the way certain things are done by some people. I think that's the biggest objection I get when I work with people on um, doing a better job of self-promotion is their biggest fear that holds them back from doing any promotion is fear of looking desperate or fear of looking like they're trying to be bigger or better than they are. And again, you can self-promote without ever doing either of those things, but it just starts with you understanding what strategy makes sense for your personality. Just like choosing what platform works for you. You, You're not going to go with Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or Facebook if you're like me and you spend less than 30 minutes a week on any of those (laughs) platforms. So it's just a matter of like, choose your own adventure. You can make this work however you want. Yeah, I love that. And I I think one thing that's really um, helpful to realize if you are somebody who is kind of find yourself shying away from the idea of sales is to think of it as service rather than sales because you have this incredible skill and your client has this incredible need and you can help them. You can solve their problems. You can take away their sleepless nights. You can 
aid their stress by providing this incredible service that you provide. So you're actually doing them a favor by telling them about what you do and how you can help. Someone who probably has done a a pretty good job of this is James Martin from madebyjames.com, I think is his URL. He does posts where he just shows what it looks like to work with him. He builds so much trust and credibility and gains followers. I think he has a couple hundred thousand followers now, but builds so much trust and credibility so that people know, like, and trust him so that when they need design work done, they need a branding package or whatever, that they know who to go to. And actually, funny enough, he's British. So he's found a way to make that that balance between being British and shamelessly self-promoting <laughs> in a way that seems to still be appealing to people. Showing your work off and helping people solve the problems that you solve is a great way to get clients because it's proven in so many different industries that that works, but most people don't do it. And we actually had the author of the book called The Go-Giver on the show probably 50 episodes ago or so. This is built off of the thing he teaches, which is go-giver marketing. I don't know if he calls it that, but I, we call it that here, where you're just sharing helpful things, helping others, and building reciprocity so that when it comes time to hire you for the thing that you do, you're the only option they have because they're not even considering anyone else because you're top of mind. You've already helped them in some way, shape, or form, even if it's only showing clarity on how something's done. For example, James Martin, he does branding for mostly bigger businesses with actual budgets. And the stuff he creates on social media really appeals mostly to other designers because they want to see the ins and outs of how he works. But it really builds trust with these bigger companies because they see how meticulous he is with this process. They see the social proof of other people saying, I like your work because of all the likes on the posts. They see how he is as a person and then they build trust with him. So it makes the sales process so much easier. One last area to go to here, Sarah, if you don't mind talking about this before we wrap this conversation up is talking about the subject that I think so many freelancers struggle with, especially when you're first getting off the day job train and transitioning into full-time working for yourself is staying motivated and productive when you're working from home and you don't have that manager over your shoulder telling you what to do every day. And so you have to wake up every day and say, what am I going to do? How do we, how do we approach that as, as freelancers? Cause honestly, I'm At this point, this episode airs 5,001 days into my self-employed career. And there's a lot of days where I still haven't nailed this. And I am always looking for ways, like you said earlier, how we always need to be learning more and we can never sit back on our laurels and, and just say, I know everything. Like I'm always looking for ways to improve this. Like how do we, how do we stay motivated and productive? Not just working from home. It can be a coffee shop or anything, but like, how do we do it when we are self-directed and we have to do the work ourselves and we don't have anyone holding us accountable? Sure. Well, there's a whole chapter in the book about this um, and there's quite a lot to cover, but let's just think of a couple of things that I could kind of share off the top of my head. First of all, I think it's worth mentioning that it does require a little bit of self-direction to go freelance in the first place. And if you're somebody that just cannot, cannot motivate yourself without being told what to do and without being given a schedule that is directed by someone else, maybe freelance life won't be for you. So it's not for everybody. It does take a certain amount of discipline and focus. But there are certainly, I mean, here in the UK, when we had the pandemic and everybody was working from home, this was just such a key issue because even people who weren't self-employed were having to work from home for the first time. And I, I talked a lot about it on the radio and things like that right then because it was affecting everybody. So I think there are um, certain things that you can do that help, such as making sure that you've got kind of a dedicated space that you work in rather than just kind of, I mean, the whole idea, like have a laptop will travel, right? But it can be just good to have a particular area of your home. I mean, I've got a dedicated office, but not everybody is lucky enough to have that. If you even have just a corner of the kitchen table or a fold out drawer in the bedroom or something that you use as a desk, it doesn't matter. What's quite important is to have sort of a space where when you finish for the day, you can put your stuff away and you can walk away from it. Like if you can put it in a drawer, you know, if you don't have a dedicated room, put it in a drawer. If you have a dedicated office, shut the door. Because otherwise what happens is that work seeps into every moment and every just every aspect of life and it's so difficult to keep work and home life separate and this is the context switching thing where when we switch our context from personal life to work life it helps to be in a different environment so that we feel that full switch into work mode because i think that's the biggest difference when we're working in an office is we make that drive to the office and now we have completely switched context from being at home 
playing with your kids if you have them or playing video games if you don't have kids because I don't know if you can do video games with kids. I don't have kids, so I don't know. And then you've separated that. Now you're at work and now it's like, I'm in work mode. Let's go. And then when you're done with work, you have the ability to just leave the office, drive back home. You have that wonderful context switch. And now we're back to personal life. So you really, you rarely have those two seep into each other. And what you're saying is like, when we're working from home, we don't get that. So how can we set up some sort of environment in order to, at least in our brains, delineate work mode versus personal mode so that they're not crossing over into each other, which I think is wonderful advice. I think my biggest issue is more on, I can't separate those two things. So I end up working too much sometimes, which then burns me out. And now I'm burnt out and now I can't get myself back into work mode. I don't even want to enter it. I'm just burnt out now. It's two extremes, isn't it? First of all, it helps to have rituals to create that kind of delineation between work and home time. This is such a silly little thing, but I I make myself a mocktail at the end of the day. So I get out my best fancy glass, lots of ice, slice of lemon, and then make myself a mocktail. And that for me is right. Okay, work time is done and home time can begin. And whatever it is for you, like I did hear about one person who left his home from the front door and would come around the back door and that would mean he's home from work and that would mean okay he's gone out the front door that work time is over and really it's just such an individual thing isn't it it's whatever works for you at any particular moment but if you've got a ritual that you know signifies the end of the day I would say just kind of getting really clear on what you want to achieve each day. I'm a big list maker so hence the Trello multiple boards on Trello and multiple um what are they like the subboard things? Cards? Yeah, multiple, multiple, multiple cards. But just kind of getting clear. Sometimes it can feel overwhelming, can't it? Seeing this huge amount of things that you want to achieve. Always good to have client tasks, your just I think even your personal things that you want to achieve during the day. So your client tasks, your kind of me time tasks, and your business, how to develop your business. So things like working on a new website, for example, or getting some professional photography done or setting up automations for your business. And then things you need for your mental health to be at its best. So for me, I know that if I exercise, I am at my maximum productivity and my motivation, my creativity, my productivity, my focus, they're all helped by exercise. So the more tired I am, the more I know that I need to take a, an exercise break. Even if it's just sometimes I walk around the block where I live, just make sure you get out in fresh air, get some sort of clear headspace because there's nothing worse than actually sitting at a computer this is the opposite of not being able to get motivated isn't it this is feeling this kind of obsession oh my god I've got to be sitting at, at my laptop but actually what happens is you're just staring at a screen you cannot cannot be productive or creative when you're not having any stimulation so sometimes it's just get a, a change of scene and also just know your strengths in terms of when you are at your most productive because if you know that you're not a morning person don't say okay I'm gonna wake up and start work at eight o'clock in the morning that's obviously not for you but if you're one of these crazy 5 a.m. starters who gets up and meditates and I wish I was you, um, that you're journaling and all this kind of thing, then maybe you might want to start work at seven and finish it too. You know, that is the brilliance of being freelance. We go freelance often to get away from that kind of routine and regularity and the pattern of working nine to five. Maybe that just doesn't work for you. And part of what's the brilliance is that our clients don't know and don't need to know what hours we work as long as we get the job done on time, on budget, and we're pleasant and enjoyable to work with. <laughs> the lamest summary, pleasant and enjoyable, always be pleasant and enjoyable. <laughs> It was such a British thing to say. But you know what I mean? Like, my clients couldn't care less what hours I work. They don't care that I don't work Fridays. You know, okay, if they need to get hold of me urgently, then they can get hold of me. I'm just not doing client work on Fridays. And that is good for me. That has been a game changer. That's really helped my energy. It's helped me get so much done in the four days I have left because I'm motivated to have Friday off. So whatever motivates you, know your strengths, know your busy times, know your best and most productive times and play to that pattern. Design your week around your strengths. Yeah. And I've known that in my own life, I actually thrive in routine. And when my routine gets thrown off, my life goes into chaos. So 
that's what I found works really well for me. Not everyone's like that, but that's just where it works well for me. And so I build a lot of routine into my day to day so that, yes, I have the lists. Yes, I have all this stuff in ClickUp, our, my project management software of choice. But I also have the routine so that every day I kind of start my day out the same way. And because of that, I tend to have pretty good average days and I don't have big highs and big lows. It's typically pretty good average days. And I can get so much more done if I have a lot of good, decent average days in a row than I can if I'm doing this up and down roller coaster of highs and lows all the time. So Sarah, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on here. Your book is called Survival Skills for Freelancers. We'll have links to that in our show notes at sixfigurecreative.com slash 211. That's this episode 211. Sarah, where can our audience go to connect with you or learn more about you? Or um, what would you like them to do? If you sign up for my newsletter, that would obviously be the ideal thing. I would say go to survivalskillsforfreelancers.com to read more about the new book. You can sign up there and you can download a free chapter of the book as a taster. If you're interested in the new book, which is what I should really be directing people to, go to confusables.co.uk and you can also sign up there and be first in line for kind of updates on the new book, which is coming very soon. Or connect with me on social. I'm sure you'll share all the social links. Just if anybody does connect with me having listened to the podcast, do drop me a DM and just let me know that you found me through Brian's pod because it's just great to know where people find me. It's always lovely to have a little bit of a story. Yeah, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to find you. So we have links to, we'll have links to your socials, your website, your new book, and the Survival Skills for Freelancers book that is out now and available for purchase. So thank you for coming on, Sarah. Pleasure.